My name is Zach Gross, for those who haven't been around the last couple days, and I am the uh, chair of the board of the CFTM. Um, Sean has made me come up here and talk <laughs> while he pours coffee down his throat. I'm sure everybody's feeling that way. I understand some people came here straight from the bar. <laughs> I noticed the bar was closed this morning when we went past it. I'm not sure what that's about. Maybe there was nothing left. Um, I'm going to do just a bit of a recap of uh, what's happened the last couple of days uh, for those people who uh, weren't able to be here. Um, and we understand that when you hold a three-day conference and people have jobs in school and, and an exciting EWB conference going on out there that you can't get to everything. Um, the first day was uh, what I would call business plus. We talked a lot about uh, fair trade business but also got into a lot of other related issues and it was really exciting for, uh, for those of us who maybe more on the activist side to have a chance to listen to and meet with uh, people who are involved in fair trade businesses of all sizes. Just first and foremost, we're going to welcome up uh, Maurice May from uh, Ariuma in just a moment, and followed by that, uh, we're going to hear from uh, Dave Cranover uh, from the Center for Social Innovation. We'll talk a little bit about both of them in just a second. Otherwise, we're gonna, we've got four sessions today, um, one uh, on, on activism and event planning, uh, the second on working with institutions, uh, the third on a little bit more on communica communications and, uh, and, and messaging and marketing, and then uh, the fourth on, uh, on structure. So it should be real. Uh, otherwise, yeah, I'd like to, uh, we will start things off by welcoming up uh, Maurice May. She is uh, the co-founder of uh, Arima and is uh, born the Spices, and now Coconut Milk from uh, Sri Lanka. And uh, yeah, she's going to talk to us a little bit about the uh, group. faces the past couple days and some new faces and I just want to thank everyone for being here today. Um, what do you think so far? It's been great, hasn't it? <laughs> thank you to CFTM for putting this on. It's fantastic. Alright, I don't want to hide anything. Can you see? Alright. about all of you, but I've grown a little bit tired of hearing talk of the developing world. Here it is. We've got the advanced economies, economies in transition, less developed, and the least developed. Hmm. When you think of the developing world, Images come to mind. Dark skinned children, hungry, malnourished. Oops, pictures. And it makes us feel like, hmm, those poor people in the developing world, they can't seem to figure it out. They can't seem to get developed enough. Hmm, maybe they need a helping hand. And it seems to me that helping hand is often just a few shades lighter than the color of the skin of their parents. We think, hmm, maybe their parents can't figure it out. Maybe they're not. I don't know, they're not developed enough, you know? So, I just want to ask this. The developing world, I mean, should I just pause for a minute? Because, yeah. You know what? Yeah, can I have stick? Do you have it? Sorry. Yeah. Comment on that. Um, the whole notion of the developing world and, and international development. Go ahead, yeah. Daniel Quinn, yeah. And the leavers and the takers. Um, I, I lived in Rwanda for I lived in Rwanda for six years and then pretty recently back to Canada. And I have yeah, I have a lot of um, hesitation with development actually, because 
let's be honest, our world can't develop the way it's been developing. It's not even possible. And I'm going to even go so far as actually uh, those advanced economies that you see there. If we want to have a world in 25 years, we have to somewhat undevelop a little bit. Um, for example, in Rwanda, there's days or weeks where water shortages occur in different areas and you just adapt. You cut your showers, you um, use your water for drinking and essentials, you know. Um, and I truly believe in my heart that there's, for sustainability, we're, we have to undevelop. That's my personal opinion. Interesting feedback. Does anyone else want to add to that? I think it's just interesting when we talk about development that it's always economic, it's always quantitative. And uh, when I was actually coming back from Senegal, I had a very interesting conversation with one of the flight attendants. Um, and he was talking about what does development mean? And we were talking about how the sense of community can be so strong in some of these developing countries. And that I think a lot of developed countries need to learn a lot from that and, and work with that and work towards that. Um, because I think it's, it's seen a lot as that we want them to become like us. And I find that very unfortunate and I find that very sad because I never want to see uh, the community where I was staying in Senegal, I never want to see them lose that spirit they have and that sense of community and that happiness to be together and be a family. And uh, I think there's so much more sharing that, that should go on between these uh, developed and developing, which I haven't found a better word for that. but. <laughs> Um, I think we kind of all kind of understand what we're talking about there, but um, yeah, so definitely just trying to just define what we're talking about. Thank you. That's very similar to the process I went through after going to Sri Lanka, where I've been a number of times. Um, stark contrast to moving from Tokyo to Sri Lanka was, it was like a breath of fresh air. People had um, a very, uh, seemed to not have much but to be happy with true happiness, community, values that we don't see in our so-called developed world all the time, so thank you. I like uh, the term industrialized and less industrialized because it, it, it is the same. What it is, it's industrialization machines. It's not necessarily development, it's not necessarily higher quality of life because there's a lot of factors to it. And um, my partner lives in Togo for two years and uh, I thought it was interesting that her village didn't know they were poor until outsiders came and told them they were poor. But before then, they thought they had everything they needed, and uh, they were as developed as they wanted to be, and uh, a lot of it's mentality. Absolutely. Economic development. Industrialization. Hi. I, I really believe that it's, um, it's actually a very measurable thing uh, why certain parts of the world are underdeveloped. And I think it has to do with corporate deregulation. Um, and I think that is the systemic root of why there's an imbalance of wealth. Uh, I believe that as long, like for example, um, companies don't have to tell you where they make their clothes. So there's absolutely no way for us to, to find out without physically going there. So it's become legally acceptable for us to be kept in the dark about where our, how our things are being made and how you know everything's being done from the sourcing process. So. It's almost, it's almost impossible for there to be any consumer action at this point until we start working on these small little milestones in legislation. For example, like capping executive pay. That would you know, help to bring back the middle class in our country and it would also uh, prevent, that, prevent CEOs from being able to create these outlandish laws that allow them to exploit the third world. And I think that it, it's a, I see, I can see how it can be changed. It's just we need to start focusing on, on our actions in this country and advocating for, for our rights to know what's happening with our products. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Sean is going to be my um, de facto projector screen. Between Mac and PowerPoint. We're having a Mac. I, 
Yes, I'm very sorry about that, but uh, hopefully some people can see. Uh, you all got to see that nice map, at least, which I thought was really interesting. When I look at that map, it, it, it gives you the sense of direction. You've got the most, the in transition, the least. It's as if we're moving towards something. But <laughs> what are we moving towards exactly is the question. Um, you know, I, I mean, I like to call it what it is. What I see is a world of inequality. I see a world full of once prosperous and self-sufficient nations, mostly of dark-skinned people, I might add, who have been systematically oppressed, colonized, their cultures have been destroyed, their traditional knowledge has been stolen, assimilated, and used against them. And you see this all over the world. I would like to even propose that um, though we, in modern times, we like to say that we've abolished slavery, there's still a form of slavery going on in most parts of the world. Uh, these nations often have fantastic resources, more than enough to go around, and yet you find people living in sub-poverty conditions, families that can't afford to feed their children. And uh, as was aptly pointed out, I also believe that this is not the result of a lack of education, a lack of development. It is an intentional result of years of oppression under colonizing countries and subsequently neoliberal policies that have been enforced, especially through the IMF and the World Bank. Just uh, I'm not sure if you can see, but this is one of the images I was referring to talk about international development and aid. Um, I've been to countries where I don't see people putting dirt all over their children, but, you know, maybe some. Um, anyways, it's hard to imagine, but uh, not so long ago, relatively speaking, um, our world was a quite a different place. Uh, nations were prosperous. Mothers could stay with their babies who were breastfed for a number of years. Uh, they weren't forced to leave them at home and go slave away in the fields or the fast food counters or the office. Ancient knowledge, which was tremendously powerful. Um, you know, all over the world we have cultures that knew things in astronomy, uh, physics, medicine. Disciplines that we consider modern, maybe Western, um, they had far more knowledge than even some of what we have today. Um, in Sri Lanka, for example, it's a country that I deal with, so I'm, I'm more aware, but I know all over the world you see the same picture. 2,000 years ago in Sri Lanka, they had devised irrigation systems that we cannot even understand today. We don't even know how they work. I have a really bad effect on computers sometimes. My roommate never used to let me use hers. Um, so this is the sort of a traditional rural looking area of Sri Lanka. But I mean, not long ago, you know, people I think were possibly living happier, um, at, to, at least um, independent, not under the rule of a, of a foreign invader. Um, in Sri Lanka, I'm specifically um, passionate about Ayurveda. It's the traditional medicine from Sri Lanka and India. And uh, just to bring you all up to date, 5,000 years ago, they were curing disease. They were, I mean, you can cure things that you can't cure with Western medicine using a very skilled practitioner in Ayurveda. Um, 2,000 years ago in India was when they started to perform surgeries. They could perform emergency caesareans, reconstructive surgery. Um, they could perform inoculations for smallpox without added mercury. Um, aluminum, formaldehyde, and all of the other bioweapons that are currently put in our modern vaccines. And they did just well without the fluoridated water. So, uh, what went wrong, you know? What happened? And, you know, although a lot of people like to say that these countries are underdeveloped, the sad truth is that it is a systematic and very deliberate oppression of these countries that keeps them in the state that we see. And, you know, if development looks like what we have, this is an irrigation, uh, some of the ancient world in Sri Lanka, 2,000 years old cities, stone carvings. 
But if development looks like what it does today in Canada, I'd like to ask you, what are we developing into? If you ask me, development in this modern form looks a lot like the development of cancer. So, very quickly, because I know we've spent a little bit of extra time on the uh, technical aspect. Very quickly, I want to go over some world domination 101. How did people accomplish this incredible feat of enslaving the world's population? How does it happen? Now, these are tricks that it's very important to become alert to because they are used not only in politics, but across social movements and really at every level of society. So I just, I just want to quickly touch on these because we see it across the board. We see it with our producers. We see it in the fair trade movement itself. So let's just take a moment. How does this happen? Divide and rule. Anyone have an example? Divide and rule. Can anyone think of a, anywhere from any, anything you've noticed? How does divide and rule go? So for instance, uh, there's a lack of solidarity in places where they're facing financial crises by sort of blaming that like, immigrants are taking the job or whatever, when in, in reality a lot of them are just going to the top and everyone at the bottom is getting screwed over, so you create a sense of infighting at the bottom. Absolutely. E economics uh, plays a big part in that. Yeah? I know one divided uh, conquer tactic that they use in Africa was um, creating countries and boundaries that combine different ethnic groups that had different political structures and different belief systems and forcing them to engage in partisan politics uh, where they had to elect someone. So obviously the person who was elected in power was going to take care of their own community uh, or look at their needs before the other which would create a polarization, and in Canada they do it um, even just politically by polarizing us by our beliefs on mundane things like, I don't know, taxes or whatever. Yeah, and I, and I like how you point out it really can happen in any country, in politics, and, and obviously as we're all aware, we see it in our own movement. Um, Hegelian dialectics, anyone familiar with that one? It's also more commonly known as the shock doctrine, or sometimes disaster capitalism, uh, or as I like to call it, the totalitarian tiptoe. But basically it's where, I think 9-11, you know, a problem is either happens or created. Um, people are put into a state of shock and fear, and they, they turn into sort of like a childlike state, and that is used, and, and people are manipulated, is capitalized on, to then push certain uh, policies or agendas forward. And that can be done through physical, psychological, and economic means financial crashes and whatnot. And the last one, inversion and deception. And I think anyone who's familiar with politicians can understand what that means. So, how do we resist? And I don't like the word resist, actually. I like the word thrive. So how do we thrive, you know, despite all of this? Um, what I see as the key factor is coming together. Coming together, breaking the divide, finding our strength in numbers, just like our producer groups do, we must do also. And we must come together and act in solidarity to thrive in this environment that we find ourselves. Um, in Sri Lanka, the, those three tactics I touched on were used quite effectively by uh, the colonizing countries starting in around 1500, which, uh, which were um, First the Portuguese, then the Dutch, and then the English. And actually, a little known fact is that in a region called Matale near Kandy, uh, where there were a lot of rural farmers uh, in the hills, there was actually a rebellion against the British rule, a peasant rebellion. And uh, they were actually quite successful in gaining back some of what they had lost under British rule because uh, the British actually expropriated them from their land and took it over to grow the cash crops like um, coffee and rubber. Incidentally, the people living on those farms who had farmed successfully for generations didn't want to work like slaves. So what did the British do? Of course, they went to India and brought their soldiers who had been enslaved already in India to Sri Lanka and we still have problems resulting from that up to this day. So in Matale, actually, uh, is the region where our products are grown, so it's kind of neat to look at that history. Um, Aruma spices and also coconut products are grown in the region of Matale and around there. And I'm going to be showing a few photos. This is one of our farmer families here. So it's quite exciting to see that despite all of that, uh, we still do have communities that are thriving. We like to support 
the empowerment of the producers, the return to their traditional ways, the use of uh, non-toxic and traditional agriculture, and um, even the use of the products of their agriculture for the traditional uh, medicinal ways that they've been used for thousands of years. For example, at Ariuma, um, uh, for example, at Ariuma we sell uh, turmeric, and now it's more commonly known that turmeric is actually a very, very potent anti-inflammatory detoxifier and a cancer-preventive agent. That knowledge has existed for thousands of years, and um, we are so excited to be working not only in solidarity with the growers of these products, but also promoting that knowledge all around the world. <coughs> so just to, just to remind us all, I think um, what, what we really have to remember is that we can use our own discernment, we can use our own free will. And so we don't have to be enslaved by policies that go against the fabric of our very being. So I'm going to talk quickly about uh, SOFA, <laughs> our farmer group in Sri Lanka. This is a, a compost project, so they do educational projects showing them how to use them, you know, uh, traditional ways that they may have lost over the generations. Here's a picture of um, certain farmers from the group uh, receiving the, the uh, tea shrubs to grow and later grow tea, so they don't actually have to pay for that. I'll touch on that later. But I like to see the strength in numbers. Every one of those individual farmers, families, who only have a one acre land, they probably wouldn't have survived, but by coming together, that's what makes the movement so powerful and so successful. So SOFA stands for Small Organic Farmers Association. They were the first uh, group of small organic farmers to become fair trade certified for spices and herbs and uh, Ariuma uh, carries uh, many of their products here in Canada. It is an independent, um, democratically run farmer society. Here's their vision, to establish an environmentally friendly, agriculturally developed, economically empowered community while treating all members in an equal manner. And their objectives, developing the land in accordance with organic agricultural methods, enhancing the socioeconomic standards of producer members, helping in education, religious, cultural, and social activities within the community, and increasing community awareness of environmental protection. So, someone asked the other day, uh, do the fair trade premiums really, do, do they really get to the farmers? Uh, I've heard sometimes they don't. I mean, I can't say for everyone, but uh, I can speak for the farmers we work with, and absolutely, I personally send money you know, to their bank, so I know they're receiving it, and we personally visit those farms, and we see some of the amazing projects that are going on. Um, here, it's very really hard to see, but it's, uh, there's a few pictures, and you probably just see the girl in the middle who's happy, but they're, they're nice pictures. Um, basically, there's a lot of community development, and I don't like the word development, but community initiatives coming out of the Fair Trade Premiums. Uh, they, they do help all the children um, have school supplies to go to school and even build daycares. Uh, they have a lot of women's projects, so for example, funds will be used to purchase sewing materials and actually train women to be able to sew garments and handicrafts, whatnot, to uh, earn extra income. Uh, a lot of community initiatives, which is really nice to see, and the whole community benefits. As I said, the farmers actually receive the uh, materials that they need, so the, the tools and even the, um, the, the, the seedlings and they, they're not forced to go into debt to grow their crops, which is really fantastic, you know, when, when you have to go into debt before the season and the prices fluctuate, you, you can come out a loser on the other end, and many farmers do, uh, which is hence, you know, the high suicide rate, in, especially in India right now, that you may be aware of in the farming community. Uh, this actually really prevents uh, the farmers from going into debt. It's a really nice initiative, so they can just, they get the materials they need, and they can grow their crops, and then they can even sell them at a, at a fair price, and then receive them. And then finally we have our spices. Uh, it's hard to see, there's a pepper vine, a cardamom, lemongrass, this is nutmeg, it grows like a little plum on a tree, curry leaf, and this is turmeric, which is a golden rhizome under the ground, much like ginger. Very cool to see how the spices grow. I brought my daughter there and got to pick cinnamon leaves and smell them. Awesome. And you know, we picture these farmers sometimes like, you know, in the developing world, they're living so poor, but I'll tell you, when I visit the farm, <laughs> I would like to live here. They have the most beautiful biodiverse spice gardens. They grow their own vegetables for like the local market. The one we visited had a beautiful rice paddy out, out back. So just absolutely stunning. And this is Chanika, my partner, my daughters, and, and one of the farmer families we visited. And it just makes us really happy as a family business and also the Sri Lankan Canadian family business to be able to work in solidarity with other families across the world who are, um, you know, we see really as our partners. 
not our suppliers, but our partners, and uh, it, it's very satisfying for us to be part of that. So, yes, the fair trade label does mean something. It does go back to the producers. You can trust it. Not the only one, but you can certainly trust that this means something to the producers. Uh, we do have this coconut milk you can find around town, some beautiful fair trade prices. And overall, I mean, those are the, the reasons why. Oh, there was one last slide. Those are the reasons why we're in fair trade. Those are the reasons why I've spent the better part of a decade committed to building this movement. And I'm so happy to see all of you here today with the same commitment, the same drive. I think that um, we can really make things happen. So thank you for being here.